in trouble. Ran right up in the night. Now they back in the huddle. Now they know we can fight. Hunting, give it every week. Me and your yeah, she mine. He won't bring you the heat. Now they know that we hit. And they know we ain't quit. Yo, she might be jigging. He won't bring it and give it. Unity, unity, unity. Cause they know we ain't stopping. And they know they got problems. And they ran out of options. Ooh, we know we got a problem. Can't get it going soft. Brain brace learning, Afrocentric history, we see tomorrow. Uh, karma is karma, I see what I say, I hear on the wall. Uh, till I see y'all fall off, then I bring y'all up on all. I'm back up on my Clyde winners. Clyde winners, 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 the fine winners, Clyde winners, Clyde winners, Clyde winners. With you, cry with you, master teacher, create master, fly winners, give respect to the elders, God winners, high winners, somebody out there, you can be International Journal of Human Genetics, and PLOS Genetics, to name a few. He has published over 40 books, including Atlantis and Mexico, the Monde in the Ancient Americas, We Are Not Just Africans, and African Empires in Ancient America. For more of Dr. Clyde Winters, check out Yoshimad Gumroad page, and that will lead you to the master himself, Dr. Clyde Winters. What up, though? What up, though? What up, though? Somebody. Somebody's looking for Clyde Winters. Where you at, Captain? Where you at? I'm going to tell you. I'm right here. I'm right here. You know, family, how you doing, Dor Doravel? Joan Coromante? What up, though? Let me tell you something. I'm very excited today. Very excited. Why am I excited? I'm excited because today is a very beautiful day. It was sunshine. Well, it was raining earlier here in Chicago, but now the sunshine is out. Because the sunshine is out, that means that I can go out and go through what's called melo, melanosynthesis. Do you want to know what melanosynthesis is, family? Melanosynthesis is this. Just like a plant on a summer's day absorbs 
the sunlight and through that through that solar energy it develops in a sense it energizes that plant that's what happens to us on a nice sunny day when we're out there in the sun when we're walking when we're sitting when we're talking what we're doing in, in a sense is that we're getting this energy we're getting this energy our melanin is, is producing that energy and we're getting turned on you know today's uh today i'm going to talk about the, the anunnaki and uh, the anunnaki the reason i chose this topic is that a lot of people ask me, Dr. Winters, what about the Anunnaki? Uh, is that real or is it unreal? Well, the thing is this is that they made a new mythology. A few years ago, they began to develop this ancient, this ancient, you know, aliens uh, theory. And this ancient alien theory, it was created so that Europeans could find a way to deny that civilizations were discovered by back by black people. Let me explain to you. See, whenever you do archaeological research, what happened is, is that when they would dig into these uh, these ancient sites, what they would find is they would find these skeletons. When they did an analysis of the skeletons, they found that they were all quote unquote Negroid or, you know, or, or Africoid people. They found in a sense that, so what happened is that this was evidence, this was evidence that, that in a sense that, that the ancient civilizations, the river valley civilizations, ancient Egypt, uh, Sumer, um, uh, the uh, Indus Valley, and Maluha or uh, Exum, that these ancient civilizations were all founded by black people. This upset a lot of uh, white supremacists. And it upset the white supremacists because they they wanted to find something that they could allow them to, you know, Bogart their way into history because the uh, Europeans, they lack any history. They don't show up in, in Europe until 1000 BC. Yes, 1000 BC. And because, because before 1000 BC, Europe was dominated by black people. So they wanted to do this thing. So then they started doing what was called population genetics. And population genetics is a study, in a sense, of the uh, study of the genome or the various genes or haplogroups that the various uh, people carried when they were, uh, you know, when they uh, died back in the day. So what they did in a sense, they would get their teeth or they would take a bone and they would scrape the teeth, scrape the bone, and they were able in a sense to, to discover the DNA. In the beginning, they felt that DNA was going to help them to be able to prove that these ancient civilizations were black, but it didn't help them at all because see, the genetic material, the genetic material was, was further confirmation that these people were black. How you doing, Dayan Epps? And because it was further com confirmation that, that these ancient skeletal remains, these ancient civilizers were black, it was much more scarier, you see. So what happened is, is that they couldn't find the archeological evidence. The, the genetic evidence wasn't really landing the way they wanted it to land. So what they did is that they decided that what they were gonna do is they were gonna do this. They were gonna they were gonna develop the so-called ancient aliens theory, and they was going to, in a sense, teach the whole world that yes, there were ancient civilizations, but they weren't really they weren't really done by human beings. These ancient civilizations were guided, were guided by people aliens from outer space. And then this guy named Zachar Zachariah Sitchin, he said, "Hey, what about the Anunnaki?" So what he did, he developed this this theory of the so-called An Anunnaki. And they said that the Anunnaki were some uh, some uh, gods, white gods from outer space that came down to earth and they made the Sumerians into slaves and they go for them. You see, and this was a beautiful concept to them. And now, now today, even though this is all made up stuff, even though there's no real discussion of, of, of any so-called Anunnaki people in the ancient Sumerian literature or Akkadian literature, They've created a whole, a whole, you know, uh, theology, is histor history of, of, of the uh, Anunnaki. And they, and they put this throughout the internet. They put this, you know, on, on, on TV programs. And people really believe that there were a people called Anunnaki and that these Anunnaki came to earth. And that, and that the civilizations, you see, that the civilizations that, that developed on the earth were not done by black people or any people at all. It was done with the assistance of the Anunnaki. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about the Anunnaki. 
I want to, uh, how you doing, Lindy Tillman? I want to talk about the Anunnaki, and I want to really discuss, is this really an accurate account of history? Is this really telling us all that we need to know in terms of how civilizations develop? Because these civilizations did not develop based upon some people from outer space, some aliens, you know. Because, see, everything is, has to be alien because if they tell you that the founders of ancient civilization was black, that would destroy all of the white supremacist ideas because the white supremacists have made a living. They've made, in a sense, themselves the dominant people on earth by pretending, yes, by pretending, in a sense, that they were, you know, the ancient people. And because they were the ancient people, then therefore, in a sense, that put them into history, you see. And Europeans, because of the fact they have no history, they've always been trying to put themselves into history. And so they, the successful way that they found to put themselves into history was by rewriting history. And the reason that they rewrote history is that they rewrote history so that we would believe, you know, an untruth. But, uh, you know, uh, I've been talking. Now, let's get into this and uh, so that we can maybe have some questions. If you do have any questions, uh, save your questions until later. Write it down and uh, put it in the chat. And uh, we'll come back to this and we'll, uh, you know, we'll begin in a sense to really discuss this whole idea. Were the Anunnaki white men from outer space? Okay, you can go to my Patreon to see the slides. Please join my Patreon. My Patreon, you guys out there. In fact, this idea for this uh, this idea for this presentation came from one of my uh, Patreon uh, members, uh, because one of my Patreon members was asking me about the Anunnaki, and so I decided that I wanted to do a full presentation. You see, you know, I'd appreciate it if if, if you guys out there would join my Patreon because it's my Patreon that allows me to do the research and and the stuff I'm going to talk about today. It's all the latest research. And so then I'm able to do this research because of my uh, Patreon members. My Patreon, they support me, and they allow me, in a sense, to buy books. They allow me to get articles because many articles are behind paywalls. And a paywall is, is what you had to do. You had to pay money maybe to read an article. And so then because I have um, a really good Patreon members, I'm able to do this. But I need more people in my Patreon. I need more of you to support me so that I can make sure that I bring to you every week a real analysis of ancient history, you know. Uh, you're on my, uh, my YouTube channel, which is uh, Clyde Winner's uh, Afrocentric uh, History. Here on this site, I have over 300. I have over 300 videos that discuss all aspects of African history. You know what, in my Patreon, what I've done is that in my Patreon, I've developed, um, I've developed uh, movie guides. And what I mean by movie guides is that I developed guides that organize my films into certain themes so that if you're really trying to study a topic, if you join my Patreon, you can look up these uh, movie guides and these movie guides will show you what videos to look at so you can learn this or that aspect of Afrocentric history. You know, So join my Patreon, check out my videos on YouTube, they're free. <laughs> and because they're free, you know, check them out because you're gonna learn something. You can order my books at amazon.com and I hope that you will buy maybe one, two, three, a hundred books. Uh, today, we're going to be talking basically about, about uh, people in uh, Mesopotamia, the Akkadians and Sumerians. And uh, if you want to find out more about this topic, you should uh, get my book, The Ancient Black Civilizations of Asia. You see, this book that tells the various black civilizations. And also, you should get my Black History Gems Essays, Volume 1 and Volume 2. In Volume 1 and 2, I discuss various aspects of Sumerian history, Elamite history. So you would want to get these volumes too and naturally get my book, The World History of the Black Race. And The World History of the Black Race, it discusses every black race that exists on the planet Earth. Get that book. Okay, and I'm very excited about my latest book. And it's called uh, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America. I'm so excited about this book because it's the first book. It's the only book that discusses the, the history of Aboriginal Black Americans. What they've done is this, is that they've always taught us, you know, every book you read, anytime they talk about Indians, 
and they talk about black people, they always make it appear that that there were red Indians and these red Indians had black people as slaves. That's false. In reality, the original indigenous people of America, they were black aboriginal people. They were the copper colored people who were described as being black by the various explorers who, uh, who, who saw them. And that's one of the reasons why I know they were black. In my uh, book, History and Culture of the, uh, of the Black Aboriginals, this book is almost 500 pages. Yes, almost 500 pages. It's almost like an encyclopedia. And it's almost 500 pages of knowledge about the various black Aboriginal people. You know, in, in the introduction, I tell you about the various African tribes, the black tribes. They don't want to be called African, but let's say black tribes. I tell how we got over here. I talk about in, uh, in chapter two, I talk about who are the dark, the dark skinned people of the Americas. I talk about the African background of the Paleo-Americans because the original people who formed the American population, they call them Paleo-Americans. And these Paleo-Americans have been in, on the North American continent for 130,000 years. Yes, 130,000 years, you see. Originally, uh, these uh, people came from Africa. And the reason that, that the original... Uh, the original uh, aboriginals came from Africa was because of the Ice Age. There was an Ice Age for about 20 to 100,000 years. And during this Ice Age, you couldn't walk from Asia across the Bering Strait into the Americas. So the only way you could get to the Americas during the Ice Age was to uh, maybe uh, take a boat from Africa. Because see, even though you look on a map and a map looked like Africa and, and America is so distant, let me tell you something. The distance between Brazil and Africa, the west coast of Africa is only is less than 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles. That's less than driving. That's less than driving from from Chicago down to Florida, Orlando. Yes, yes. That's just to show you how close the African continent is to Brazil. You see. So again, I get my book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America. It's almost uh, it's almost 500 pages. This book will tell you every aspect of the aboriginals. And it also explains that, you know, a lot of black people, when they're talking about the Americas, they just say, oh, it was black people in America. Then they talk about the pyramids and down in Mexico. And then they talk about, in a sense, the pyramids in South America. And they talk about this, and they talk about that. But see, in my book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America, I tell you about the pyramids that we made. Yes, we made pyramids, stone pyramids, and we made roads. Okay. Uh, Following success of part one of the new Black British history course delivered by Dr. Winters and Sister Shanice, get ready for part two. Yes, yes, we uh, we taught part one, and part one, in a sense, dealt with the uh, earlier the earlier history of uh, of uh, Black people in Britain. In this uh, part two, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about uh, the um, the European Neolithic. We're going to talk about the uh, the Celts. We're going to talk about the various uh, Pit Pittish people. We're going to talk about the uh, the black Britain, the black British Britannian, uh, uh, you know, uh, Romans during the Roman period. Take this course. This uh, course, in a sense, part two is going to begin on April 29th. And uh, you can find a link to the uh, course at HTTPS colon slash slash sister Shanice dot gumroad com slash L slash F U P F U. You see, and then we also have a discount. Okay, the course is going to be 199 pounds, you know, per class. But if you register register for the class before April, you can get a discount. You get a fifty dollar discount off the course, and you can uh, you can get this uh, discount at https colon slash slash sister Shanice dot gumroad dot com slash L slash F U P F U slash early bird. You see, remember the course starts uh, the 29th of April. Join us in this new black, this new British um, black history course. It's uh, it's going to take place between 730 and 930 PM. That's not, a, that's not American time. That's, that's a uh, London time. So 730 to 930 PM, that would be 130 that would be 1.30 p.m. Central Time in the United States. But we're going to, but because of the fact, in a sense, that 
that we're hoping that many people in Britain and the Caribbean may want to take this class. The class will begin at 7.30 p.m., last until 9.30 p.m. Like Sister Jenny said, sometime we would talk all the way, you know, all the way to maybe 10 or 11, you know, because of the fact that we had such a good class and, and people were so very interested in this period. So it's going to start Monday, 29th of April, 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. London time. American time would be uh, 1.30 p.m. So, uh, so make sure if you uh, join this class that you understand it's not on American time. It will be on uh, London time. Uh, where the Anunnaki white spacemen, you know, when we think about this, they, they want to give you this mysterious idea. They want you to feel in a sense that these people, they came from outer space and they, you know, they taught, they taught humans everything. What is FBA? I'm FBA. FBA is not a group. FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry or pedigree. As a result, we are descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. B1 is acknowledging a Black African ancestry and mob, not heritage. We must be race men and women proud of our culture and African Black ancestry. Yes, 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 you had to be B1. You see, that's how the European took over Africa. He had the African tribes fighting each other and eventually even selling each other into slavery. Sadly, sadly, he had the Aboriginal Black people fighting each other over here in the United States. These Black people, like, like the Black people in Africa, they fought each other in wars. And, they, uh, and once they would uh, defeat their enemies, they would sell their, their Aboriginal enemies to the uh, European who made them chattel slaves on the plantations. Yes, yes. The European took over the world by, by divide and rule. He took over the world in a sense because instead of these various black aboriginal tribes and these various sub-Saharan African tribes, instead of them seeing themselves as one group, like the Europeans, yes, the Europeans fight, but they always stood together to fight against us. So you had to be B1, you see? If you call yourself a Hebrew, if you call yourself a Moor, if you call yourself a Muslim, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a Baptist, Catholic, if you call yourself in a sense, and if not, so all you're doing is you're, call, you're creating division. And it's this division that allows the Europeans to dominate us. It's this division that allows them to rule us. But when you say you are B1, Black first, then hey, you know, you're in unity. Then some people will say, I'm not going to call myself by an adjective. Uh, you know, Black is an adjective. You're, you're full of it. The greatest civilization in the history of mankind the ancient Egyptians, they called themselves Kamiyu, Kamitru, the black people, the black people. And they said their, their land was what? Kemet, the black land. So don't give me that stuff that, uh, that, that when you call yourself black, you're calling yourself an adjective. No, you're, you're saying in a sense that you're black, just like the greatest civil, civilization on earth, the people of Egypt call themselves black, you see. So stop it. We have been taught a history of lies, a history where we are the victims of white racism. These lies teach us that we are a people too weak to defend ourselves because of, that, because of the natural superiority of the European race over the primitive African, whose emotionalism makes it impossible for them to do anything without the guidance and direction of the Europeans. Yes, yes, that's what he teaches. That's history's greatest lie. But the thing is, this is that we have to run away. We had to move away. We had to get away from these lies. Yes, yes, yes. I bet you didn't know the foundational Black Americans have an hist uh, a historiography. Yes, yes. FBAs have a historiography that teaches and, stre and strengthens white lies while promoting CADES. Culturally acquired identity immune deficiency syndrome. History is a study of past events, particularly in human affairs. Historiography is the study of historical writings. FBA historiography is based on the Bible due to racism and the white supremacist monopoly of knowledge and institutions where real history is taught. It's very important to understand that, you know. See, we, we've been taught that the Bible is history, that the Bible is the word of God, you see. And we've been taught in the sense that, that the Bible is just one big, one big book that, in a sense, tells us the word of God, but that's not really true. The, the books of the Bible, the Bible is made up of books. The first, the first books of the Bible are called the law, like Genesis, you know, 
Genesis, Leviticus, you know, Exodus, Numbers. Those are Deuteronomy. Those are, those are law books, but they're also history. Then the second books of the Bible is the history. Then you have the poetry. Then you have the major prophets. Then you have the minor prophets. Then you have the New Testament. And the New Testament is made up of 27 books. You have the Gospels. You have history. That's the Acts. Then you have Paul's letters. You see? Then you have general letters. Yes, yes, yes. We've been taught in a sense that the Bible is everything. You see? And because of the fact that, that the Bible is everything, foundational Black Americans have based their entire history on the Bible. Yes, yes. We based our ancient history on the Bible because we, in a sense, we weren't allowed to go to the uh, major institutions where you could, uh, you could possibly learn real history, you know like the University of uh, Chicago or Cambridge or the University of Philadelphia, you know. These are places where they studied history, you know, you see. Yeah, we had Black people at the University of Chicago, but they were they were studying, in a sense, divinity. They wanted to study about, about Christianity, so they were going to be taught the dogmas, you see, the lies. Because, see, the European has always used the Bible. He's always used the Bible to keep us down. He's used the Bible, in a sense, to get us to run away from the truth and reality. And because of the fact that most of us didn't really go to school and study to be historians, yes, yes, it's sad to say. It's sad to say. Look at Gates. You see? Look at uh, look at uh, Asante. These brothers led African stu Afro-American studies department for years, but they weren't, they weren't historians. They were people in literature. See? And yet Gates, who was a, ma a literature major, now he's teaching you about history of the world. He can't teach you about history. He can only be a regurgitator. He can only be a spokesperson for those white people, in a sense. But see, we learned our historiography through the church. Yes, yes. I first learned about black people where uh, the Egyptians were black from the church. And the church taught me that we were the children of Ham and that Egypt, in, that Egypt, in a sense, was one of the greatest Hamite civilizations. Yes, I learned that Egypt was black. I didn't learn that in school. I learned it in the church, you see. But again, you see, FBA historiography is based on the Bible due to racism and white supremacist monopoly of knowledge and institutions where real, where real history is taught. Okay. Because of the fact, in a sense, that, that, that our historiography is based on the Bible, these are some of the beliefs that we, that we have, you know, as, as just growing up as, as a foundation of Black America. Number one, anybody who studied and know the Bible is a teacher who knows ancient history. That's right. Anybody in a sense who says they're called by God or they can cite some, they can cite some biblical phrases, then they can in, then we look at them as being, you know, uh eminent scholars because they're Bible scholars, because they can regurgitate to us the history based upon, you know, the uh books and and you know, Leviticus, Genesis, things like that. Number two, we've been taught that the Bible is the word of God. We've been taught that the Bible is the word of God when when we know in a sense that the Bible is not the entirely word of God. There are parts of the Bible that are the word of God. And, and, and those parts of the Bible would be the those parts of the Bible that relate to what? The prophets. Because the prophets, they were talking about what God told them. They were talking about various events based upon prophetic activity. But the rest of the Bible, that's not, that's not the word of God. And in fact, the first books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, etc., those books are, are basically history. And sometimes the books are talking about the same events, but from different perspectives, just to show you that it's not, not the word of God, but the prophets are different. I'm not saying that all that, that the Bible is, is all made up, but I'm saying that when it comes to those books, when it comes to what we've chosen to be our historiography, those books are, in a sense, that's history. Those books are not the word of God. Okay. The third thing we've been taught is that the Shemites or the Jews were the chosen people of God. Number four, we've been taught that the original language of mankind was Hebrew. And finally, we've been taught that the Egyptians were evil and enslaved God's chosen people. And therefore, the Egyptians were the enemies of Israel. This is what we've been taught. We've been taught those five things, you see. But when you really look at ancient history, you find that this is not really, in a sense, reality. Because what does history teach us? History teaches one, the chosen people of God are not believers, are not believers that are only Hebrews. The chosen people of God is anybody who believes in God as our creator. Number two, 
Hebrew is not the original or even the most ancient language spoken by mankind. No, it's not. For example, the Canaanites and Akkadians of Mesopotamia, they were descendants of Ham, according to the Bible, right? That's what the Bible tells you. Yet they spoke a semantic language, like Hebrew. Whereas, whereas Medanetcher, spoken by the Hamites of Egypt, was not. So then, therefore, how could, in a sense, uh, of the Shemites, only Shemites speak, speak Hebrew, when we had, in a sense, the Akkadians and the Canaanites, they were speaking of semantic language, too. But that's a lie that we've been taught. But it's not, it's not really reality. As a result, there, as a result, therefore, there is no such thing as Shemite blood and language that is supposed to unite the children of Shem as alleged by the black Hebrews. Yeah, you find a lot of black Hebrews. They're yeah, they based upon the blood. We are the Shemites. And because we're the Shemites, we're the descendants of the Shemites, and we're carrying on the we're carrying on this. And get out of here, that's bull. The Akkadians and the Canaanites, who were in a sense Hamites, they spoke, they spoke a Semitic language too. Get out of here. Study, learn. That's why I teach a research class. I teach a research class so that people who take my class can learn how to understand and interpret ancient literature. Number three, the Egyptians did not practice slavery. No, they didn't. And the pyramids were not built by slaves. They were, they were community building projects where the workers were paid for their labors every Easter. Every Easter, when we when we look at we look at this program and they talk about Moses and they talk about how 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 in a sense the uh, Gyp, the uh, Jews were building the pyramids, the Jews were working as slaves. They weren't slaves. There's no evidence that the Egyptians had slavery. But this is the lie you've been taught. This is the lie we believe, and we believe because it came what? It's because it's supposed to come from the Bible. And the Bible supposed to be the word. Word of God. Number the four, the Egyptians and other African people recognized entities that they felt could help them in their everyday activities, but they all believed in the supreme God. Yes, yes, yes. All black African people believed in the supreme God. They may have felt that it was spirits that 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 you could ask to be an to be an intermediary between you and God, but as as a Christian or as a Muslim. Don't we want to, don't we say we're praying in Jesus' name? What's the difference of saying that we're praying in Jesus' name as well as when people say they're praying, they're praying in the name of the water God or whatever? It's all bull. But see, but the whole point you had to remember is that every, every, every black and African group believed in a supreme God, you see? And usually they believed in the God Amma. You see, Ammon, Ammon, Ammon was the Egyptian name of the secret God. That was the all-powerful God, the creator. And today, whenever we say our prayers as a Christian or Muslim, whenever we say our prayers, we are in our prayers with Amin, Amin. That is Emma. But you've been taught that Amin means grant my prayer. No, you're still praying to Emma. The Egyptian God, get out of here. Get out of here. You would know this if you studied your history instead of just accepting whatever your enslavers, these settlers taught you when they took your land away from you. You see, number five, the Hebrews of Judea and Israel did not see the Egyptians as their enemies. They were fighting the people of the sea. Yes, yes. You see, if, 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 if Israel... And Judea was against the Egyptians. Why don't we hear about any wars between the Egyptians and the uh, and the Judeans? Have you ever noticed that? See, when the people of when the people of the sea when they were attacking attacking the uh, the Hebrews, they Ju people in Judea and Israel they went and got who they went and got the Egyptians to help them fight. When the Assyrians when the Assyrians in a sense were were were, were coming down into the uh, into uh, to attack Judea. And, it, and, uh, and Israel, they went where? They went to Egypt to get help. So then, but they teach you, they taught us. They taught us that the Egyptians and, and, and the people of Israel were enemies because the Egyptians held the, the, the so-called Israelites as slaves. And that was a lie, you see. But that's historiography that we've been taught, you see. But history, history needs a reality check, see. 
There was a, this is what history should really begin with. There was a great flood that destroyed Anu, trade and urban centers around the world, leaving only Anu civilizations in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Anu is the name of the original people who built the great civilizations. The Anu today are the people we call the Twa or the Pygmy people of Central Africa. These people were the Anu and they ruled the world for over 10,000 years until a great flood came. And then after the great flood, they were defeated by, in a sense, you know, Nama, you see. People lived in the Green Sahara after the flood. They expanded out of Africa into the Levanda Mesopotamia, beginning with Minis or Nama. Epi historiography came from, from Caucasians. Yes, yes, you see. Yes, the things that the things that we that we learn today and the things that we believe in in terms of, of what we believe is our hidden, our historical records, which most of us always run to the Bible. You know, that was taught us by Caucasians. And the, Ca the Caucasians had a reason why they taught you this, you see? See, prior to Nat Turner insurrection, FBA believed in Jehovah as a God of war and liberation for FBA. Yes, you do not find any, uh, any, any enslaved people talking about Jesus Christ and all that type of mess before, before Nat Turner's insurrection. Nat Turner, he was, his ancestry was Sub-Saharan African and, and Black Aboriginal because he, the first chattel slaves on the plantation were Black Aboriginal slaves and Black Irish. You see? You see? Caucasians demanded that church services be attended by whites and emphasis, and emphasis was placed on Jesus rather than Jehovah. They, they changed everything. After 1831, they made sure, here's a, here's a little wood carving. You see? Look at this uh, picture on the, uh, on the other side. This illustration, this illustration is from the uh, London News. And this illustration shows a black preacher, but look, look, there's a white woman on his left side and there's a white man on the right side. And see, white people made sure to be at the, be at these churches or be wherever the, wherever the, uh, the enslaved people were being instructed in the Bible. A white person was there to make sure that people got away from believing in Jehovah because see, Black people weren't dumb. Black people weren't slave, slave people. They didn't want to look for no, no God of peace to save them. They liked Jehovah because Jehovah was a God of war. Jehovah was a God of liberation. So ca Caucasians demanded they be at every uh, be at every service, you see? And then they wanted to make sure in the sense of that, that that black preacher, that that black leader of, of the church services would teach exactly what they wanted them to teach, you see? They wanted to teach that foundational black Americans were descendants of Ham, who no other creed should be slaves, you see? They wanted him to teach that all African civilization was founded by so-called white emetic people, and that these white people, they were so benevolent, they were so nice, and if we just if we just obey white folks, we'd be all right. They were taught us that FBA, foundational black Americans, would receive their reward in heaven if they obey their masters or anyone that abuses them. Yes, 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 yes. At the Nat Turner's insurrection of 1831, they took over all, all instruction, religious instruction. They made it a policy <clears throat> that a white person had to be in that church every time these services. That's why we got this warped historiography. That's what allows us, in a sense, to believe in this so-called hermetic curse. <clears throat> Though the myth has been used for centuries to provide a biblical rationale for the subjugation and mistreatment of Afri African people. It has been used to justify a number of evils, including racism, slavery, and lack of support for poor African nations. This is what they teach you. This is supposed to be the hermetic curse. When Noah woke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him, so he said. Curse be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and the, Canaan, and the Canaanite be his servant. The racist, this racist theory was widely held during the 18th and 20, to 20th centuries, but it's been largely abandoned, you know, since the mid 20th century. But they used this to justify our enslavement, and they used us to develop this historiography, because like I said before, you know, Black people, I mean, except for me, name a Black historian. You can't name any. No. You see? Okay, we had some great Black historians like Jay Rogers, you know? 
We all we also had George, George John Jackson, see. But these people, in a sense, they they taught ancient history, but they taught that our history was great. They taught our history was grand, but people didn't read those books because our our people, our historiography, our history book was the Bible. See, and people love the Bible being the history book because anybody could be a be a scholar then, as long as they read the Bible. FBA views towards ancient history from old Cades. The letters Cades means culturally acquired immune identity deficiency syndrome. Cades has caused much destruction in the African American community. Cades is a psychological equivalent to the AIDS virus. This is an infectious mental illness that causes the individual to lose his or her immunity to white, second frequency, mental domination of their mind, and loss of identity as noted by Joan Coromante, a member of my Patreon. How you doing, Joan? As a proud black man or woman, due to acceptance of white supremacist tenets, that black historical and cultural values must be rejected in favor of feelings of inferiority, empty self-esteem, and being subservient to Caucasian, cultural and historical values. They manipulate to harm African and black people generally. Yes, when black people don't know their history, they lose their immunity to whiteness. They lose their identity. And because they lose their identity, they begin to think that they're just as good as white people. And when they begin to, when they begin to think they're just as good as white people, that's their downfall. You say, what are you talking about, Dr. Winters? We are just as good as white people. No, you're not as good as white people. You're better than white people. Yes. You're better than white people because if you were just as good as white people, we wouldn't have white supremacy. We wouldn't have white people developing racism or race in which they're going to always win and they're going to make sure that you lose. See, you only do those things if the, if the people that you're confronted with, that you're competing with, you feel are superior to you. So no, no, you'd never believe that you're as good as white people. You're better than white people. But when you believe you're just as good as white people, then you lose your identity. You begin in a sense to think you're white and then before you know it, you have a downfall. Cases cause much destruction in the African and Black community. The aim of knowing your history is to strengthen your cultural awareness of Black and African people so they can have the self-confidence to fight caves. Afrocentrism is the ideational code Blacks can use to conceptualize the universe in which they live and interact. Culture can be defined as man's learned, accumulated social experience, including man's art, belief, customs, knowledge, law, and morals that are transmitted and shared by a social group. In general, culture refers to a system of learned ideas, not what we do or make. As a rule under white supremacy, history is whatever white people say it is. Even though archeologists have found ancient artifacts of blacks, the white supremacists demand that you ignore what you can see with your own eyes and replace it with images they make up. Yes, yes, yes. That's why, that's why we believed in a sense. That's why that's why some people, some black people sadly believe that sadly believe that the Egyptians and the Sumerians were white. Because that's the image that the European has planted in their mind. But this is not reality. See? This is not reality. White supremacists teach us that the history of, of mankind was constructed by the white man. They even claim that a superior race of white gods came from outer space to teach us about civilization. This is a story popularized by Zechariah Sitchin that the Anunnaki, extraterrestrials from a planet past Neptune called Nibiru, in search of old gold, came to Earth and made the Sumerians, who were black, into slaves. Here we will discuss this story and determine if it was true or not that white, that white gods made us slaves thousands of years ago. There are numerous videos about the Anunnaki as a group of gods from outer space. They created mankind to mine gold for them. The Anunnaki theories represent a fascinating aspect of ancient astronaut theory, which proposes that extraterrestrials visited, beings visited Earth in ancient times, and had a significant influence on human civilization. In Sumerian literature, Ananuna 
encompasses the major deities of the Mesopotamian pantheon. These theories are primarily based on interpretation of ancient texts, artifacts, and archaeological discoveries, often blending elements of mythology, pseudoscience, and speculative history. While widely regarded as a pseudoscientific by mainstream scholars, Anunnaki theories have captured the imagination of many enthusiasts who seek alternative explanations for the mysteries of human history. Yes, yes, yes. The term Anunnaki originates from the Sumerian mythology, where it refers to a group of deities who were believed to have played a role in the creation and governance of the world. According to ancient Sumerian texts, such as the Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Anunnaki were powerful beings who descended from the heavens to earth. They were often depicted as humanoid figures with, with otherworldly abilities and advanced knowledge. For example, in Sumerian, we have Anun, Anuna. In the academy, we had Anunnaki, Inunnaki. The local graphic is Anun, Anuna, Anunnaki, Kieni. And the cryptographic is Gashu. At the, the term Anunnaki first appears in the post Akkadian period, namely in some Gudea inscriptions and in a few Ur er, three texts. In its Akkadian forms, Anunnaku or Anunnaki continue to occur into the, the Seleucid period. The term Anununa indicates a group of gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon. Later on, it is sometimes used to describe the underworld gods as opposed to the gods of the heavens, the Egigi. So again, as you can see, this whole idea of Anunnaki, it doesn't, doesn't talk about some, some space aliens. No, no, no. But that's how it's interpreted today. You see, one of the central themes of Anunnaki theories is the idea that these ancient astronauts came to Earth in search of valuable resources, particularly gold. Proponents of this theory point to ancient texts that describe the Anunnaki interests in mining operations and their use of human labor to extract gold from the earth. Some interpretations suggest that the Anunnaki genetically engineered humans as a slave species to assist them in their mining endeavors. Another aspect of Anunnaki theories is the notion that these extraterrestrial beings imparted advanced knowledge and technology to early human civilizations. Ancient structures such as the pyramids of Egypt and the megalithic temples of South America often cite as evidence of this influence. According to proponents of Anunnaki theories, these structures were built with the assistance of alien technology, which enabled ancient humans to achieve feats that would have been impossible with their primitive tools and knowledge. And they teach you this stuff, and they know it's a lie, but they teach you this stuff because when you look at the images, when you look at the figurines and you look at, and you look at the, uh, the, the, the iconographic evidence relating to these ancient civilizations, they all show black people. Yes, they show so-called Negro, Negro featured people with physiology like other black people that you see today. And so they had to develop this Anunnaki theory to, to try to explain away, in a sense, the presence of these black people and say, oh, yeah, they were there, but they were slaves. Get it? Black people have always been slaves. So if the black people build ancient Egypt, if the black people build Sumer, they were still slaves. Get it? Get it? Yes, you should get it. They did this in a sense to maintain that, that continue to maintain that lie that the only history of black people is as slaves. See? Furthermore, Anunnaki theories often intertwine with other conspiracy theories and alternative historical narratives. Some proponents suggest that the Anunnaki were responsible for shaping human religious beliefs and that they continue to exert influence over modern society through secret societies and shadowy organizations. Others speculate about the existence of hidden knowledge and ancient artifacts that could unlock the mysteries of human origin and the true nature of the universe. Yes, yes, anything but black people, don't you see? They want you to think of anything but black people. Anything but black people created civilization. Anything but black people built the pyramids. Anything but black people did all of those ancient, built all those ancient structures. Anything, in a sense, to make you feel that some white folks from outer space, just like the white people on Earth, made these black people their slaves, you see? The Anunnaki theory is just a continuation of that whole myth, you see, that the white man has always ruled the world. That whole, that old myth that is only through white supremacy and the white supremacists that salvation has come to mankind. 
salvation has come to the black man, which is a lie. However, it's important to approach Anunnaki theories with a critical eye and a healthy dose of skepticism. While they may offer intriguing explanations for certain historical phenomena, they often lack credible evidence and rely heavily on speculative interpretations of ancient texts and artifacts. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of times they, they show these artifacts, they show these inscriptions, they say, oh, this proves that this would have not. You know, they don't. When you really read these artifacts, and that's what I'm gonna do soon, when I show you what these artifacts are really saying, you're going to see that this whole idea about the Anunnaki is nothing but BS. Moreover, mainstream archaeologists and historians can generally dismiss Anunnaki theories as pseudoscientific and unfounded. Yes, it is because it is. Given this reality, we have to seriously discuss the possibility that the Anunnaki theories lack any validity. Although there are tons of videos, yes, 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 tons of videos on YouTube that make it appear that the Anunnaki theories are based on fact instead of fiction. In reality, what they're teaching you is a lie. What they're teaching you is false. What they're teaching you is not the truth. Jason Jarrell and Sarah Farm in a recent article in Ancient Origins discussed the reality that Judge Uriah Sitchin probably mistranslated several Sumerian texts. According to Sitchin, there were a number of Sumerian seals that relate to the Anunnaki, who came from the heaven to create man and enslave mankind to work in the mines. Although this is the opi opinion of Sitchin, the Sumerian seals they cite as evidence for the enslavement relate to the simple worship of the gods by the Sumerians. Yeah, they're just, they're just talisman. They're just amulets. They're, they're just documents that, that were written in a sense to pay homage to the Sumerian gods. They're not talking about some white people coming from outer space enslaving us. These seals were talisman meant to encourage the Sumerian people <coughs> to reflect on their gods and do good. You see, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about the Sumerian seals, but first let's, uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to show you a few commercials. How are you doing team Zulu? How are you doing Noble G, uh, GJ, Demetrius Shepard? What up, dude? Let's see, uh, Let's uh, look at a few commercials and then we'll get back to the, uh, the presentation. Hey, I've just written a new book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals of America. Yes, yes, I've written a new book. This book is called History and Culture of Afro-Americans. It's about the Aboriginal Americans. It's about the first people who inhabited America. Many people don't know about our great culture, this super culture that we created, but I discussed this book. In 489 pages, you'll find out so much information, great information, about, in a sense, what uh, the Aboriginal foundational Black Americans did. You're going to see, in a sense, that Black people contributed much here. When the first Europeans got here, that's what they found. Yes, they found Black Aboriginals inhabiting the Americas. It was the Black Aboriginals that built this country. This is why you had to get my book, get my book, History and Culture of the Aboriginal Blacks of the, the Americas. In this book, you will find out the truth. You will know what we created. You know who we are. Get this book. Buy it now. Today is the day. We need to homeschool our children due to white supremacy. In many states, education departments are passing laws to deny our children from learning the history of foundational black Americans. Today, you can learn how to organize your ch and teach your children in a homeschool in my book, A Guide to Homeschool, Foundational Black Americans. You can use my book, History of Blacks in America from Prehistory to 1877 to teach our children their, their history, their history here in the United States. You can use my book to teach world history. And this book I've written is called 
the world history of the black world. This will teach your children about every black civilization in the world. Get this book. The time is now. Get these books to teach your children about their greatness, to prevent them from losing confidence in their own ability to learn and be successful future adults in employment and education. Hey, it's time for the Afrocentric Researcher course led by Dr. Clyde Winters. Join this course. The 15-week Afrocentric Researcher course will begin on April 16, 2024. It will last between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can go to Clyde98.gumroad.com slash L slash to join the class. The Afrocentric Researcher course is vital. In this course, you will learn how to do research. It will help you to write and, and conduct research. You see, you're going to learn how to do research. You're going to learn how to interpret research literature. And you're going to learn how to write books and articles. Yes, yes, books and articles. And you're going to learn how to use research data to improve your small business. Already, in a sense, many former students have began to write articles and books that they published. You too can write these articles and books after you take my class. You can make a single payment of $599. You can go to Clyde98.gumroad.com slash L slash ZBWRJR. Or you can make monthly payments. Go to Clyde98.gumroad. Join me for my 15-week Afrocentric Researcher course. It's going to be the class that's going to help you to really be a success. It's going to start... April 16, 2024, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Join us. Join us in this class. Learn how to do research. It's up to you. I hope that uh, I hope that you guys will buy these uh, books. I hope you'll join me in my uh, Afrocentric uh, researcher class because we do need researchers. And as I said, I've been very excited because many of the people who've taken my class, they've published books, they've published uh, research articles. Many of these research articles, you know, they're being contacted by other scholars, <laughs> including white scholars, you know, asking them for help in, in their research because of the fact that, uh, that that my students are really demonstrating to the world that, that we do have a history, we do have a great culture. And I, and I really hope to, in a sense, train even more people to be able to do research and be able to bring receipts. But let's get back to uh, to our talk. You know, the Sumerian seals, they're not about, they're about faith. They're not about, they're not about space gods. You know, a careful translation of these seals indicate that they have nothing to do with space travel, the so-called Niburans. These seals relate to being good, good luck talisman, reminding the bearer of the seals to worship their gods, not space travel. These are the two major, uh, two major Sumerian seals that they use and that they claim that this that these seals are talking about the uh, the Anunnaki. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to break down each one of these uh, these seals, and uh, they're written in uh, what's called Proto-Sumerian. Proto-Sumerian was a local syllabic script. I'm going to uh, translate these uh, these inscriptions so you can see what the Sumerians were really saying. You see, yes, yes, yes. Some people are saying, well, how do you know Sumerian? Well, I studied it. You see, I had to study Sumerian tomorrow. I studied about seven, eight languages. You know, at least I wanted to get a reading knowledge of the languages because the fact in a sense is that I wanted to find the roots of our history. And the only way that you can find the roots of our history is you have to learn the languages that were spoken by these people, you see. And that's why uh, I learned Sumerian, and it allowed me, in a sense, to read these proto-Sumerian proto syllabic symbols on these uh, seals. Again, uh, you can get these books, The Ancient Black Civilization of Asia, Black History, Gem, Essays, Volume 1, Volume 2. But, uh, you know, before Egypt, the My Confederation of Africa's First Civilization, this is a very important book, because in this book, I discuss the fact that that the people who founded the, uh, the Mesoamerican Civilization, the Indus Valley Civilization, Ancient Egypt, and uh, and in a sense, the uh, ancient uh, Maluhite or or, or Exumai civilization, they all came from the Sahara. And in my book, Before Egypt, the Mog Confederation, Africa's First Civilization, in this book, I tell you about these ancient civilizations. 
And this allows you to get a perspective and understand how our people migrated out of Africa into Mesopotamia and founded the uh, great civilizations, River Valley civilizations. The Sumerians, the land of Ki and Gi. The Sumerians called their, uh, their land Ki and Gi. There are a number of proto-Sumerian texts. These texts are usually found on seals that depict Sumerian gods in writing. Let's examine the seal below. The Sumerians originally lived in Middle Africa. When they went to Mesopotamia, they took the Saharan writing with them, using the Vice script to learn the phonetic value of the inscriptions in the Sumerian language. I'm able to read these uh, various inscriptions. Let's read the seal written in the, in the Proto-Sumerian symbols. The V, the V sign, and small t sign, signs are read me, mesh, praise the diviner. Connected to this sign are three additional symbols, a half moon sign with a line in the middle that goes below the half circle and turns into a pyramid placed just above the human head of feline. Okay, uh, look at that. So look at the, uh, look at the, uh, the seal and I'll describe it again. The, v's, the V and small t signs are read me, mesh, praise the diviner, myo, myo mesh. Connect to this sign are three additional symbols, a half moon sign with a line in the middle that goes below the half circle and turns into a pyramid placed just above the human head of feline. Beginning with the line above the half moon, we read, Iapa, the diviner, the diviner, the leader to capture the water course. The divine is probably the figure sitting on the box sign with a small T inside. The box with a small T inside reads Bumesh, the perfect diviner. So uh, let's look over there at that uh, box. And you can see the uh, see the uh, personage on the box. And the box has a small T inside. On the diviner's arm, we see three wavy lines above the arm on the rudder. These wavy lines these wavy lines can be interpreted as the word Z, the breadth of life. So again, look over there. You see that the figure that's sitting on the box. Look at his shoulder. You can see the wavy lines. And these wavy lines mean Z, as I said earlier. At the rear of the boat, we see a figure holding one sign in his hand. And another sign is near the bottom of his robe. The sign in his hand is called Ta and Trust. The line on his robe is a compound sign, Tula, Tula, make the luxurious libation. The seal would read from left to right as follows, entrust the diviner to make the luxurious libation. The breath of life is the perfect diviner. Praise be diviner. He is the leader who will subdue the water course. See? And, you know, and, and so it makes this a, such a perfect trans translation. As you can see, this is a boat, and as you can see, they're on a boat, and they're, and we have the waves that are carrying the boat. This doesn't say anything about no outer space. There's nothing in this that says anything about the Anunnaki, but they will tell you that this seal, this Sumerian seal is talking about the Anunnaki, some white gods from outer space. They're not, that's not what it's really saying. Let's look at some of the other seals. Here's another interesting Sumerian seal. On this seal, we see the sun god between two peaks, you see. Paul Menensela has observed in relation to this figure the following. The sun god stands between the peaks of Mount Mashu, located in the end of the earth to the east and through which the sun rises from the underworld. So let's uh, look at that, the sun god between the twin peaks. Okay. Let's now, let's, let's look at this and, and let's try to read some of the symbols, you see. Uh, if you look over on the right-hand side, I've broken down some of the uh, symbols. As you can see, uh, in front of them, we have Ita, Ita Mai, you see. Then along the bottom, we have some of the other signs. We have, in a sense, uh, Ma, Mash, Pu, Gao, you see. So again, these are some of the signs, and I, I wanted you to see how, how these signs were developed. And so again, we can see that this is a seal, but this seal, in a sense, the this seal is really telling us to say an emerged deity to open here a phenomenal area of your power, you see. 
But see, it's not talking about the uh, gods, but I'm going to go, I'm going to discuss them in detail. But I just wanted to let you see how, how I broke down the various proto, proto-Sumerian signs. Let's see what the inscription says. On the arms of the sun guy, we see three wavy lines on each arm. Remember, we saw the three wavy lines on the other up, on the other one. You know, let's go back. See in this figure, we see on this figure sitting on the box with the T. You notice we can see again the uh, the three wavy lines on his shoulder. See, okay. So just as he has the the, the uh, three wavy lines, the wavy lines mean Z. There are proto-Sumerian signs before the figure and behind the figure. In front of the sun god, we have the following. Itamai, emerge deity to open here a phenomenal area of your power. Behind the figure, we read the following. Mash, Mash Pugao, the deity's perfect diviner is great. So again, in a sense, this seal that, uh, you know, this seal reads, emerge deity to open here a phenomenal area of your power, you see. But see, nothing here again. There's nothing here about any uh, Soko Anunnaki, is it? You see? We have a very interesting Sumerian Akkadian seal. Some researchers claim the cuneiform inscription reads, Ada, Ada, the Dupsar, or scribe. The figure with pointed hats represent gods. Among the, the Medes and Mandi, the pointed hat represented a priest. So I want you to take a minute and, uh, you know, just look at that. Take a minute to look at that, that seal. You know, look at some of the figures. Look at some of the various, uh, the imagery that we're, that we're seeing from this, you know. And then I'm going to uh, continue it, you know. Okay. The, fr- the, the figure with the streams of water with fish flowing from his shoulder is Enki. God of the subterranean water. Do you see that? Do you see him? He has the fish that are coming, you know, coming out. The law and giver of the law and giver of the law and gives rulers the intelligence and craftsman ability. Enki's leg is bare and probably represents leadership. Behind Enki is the two-faced vizier, Usimu. Next is Ishtar. She has wings and weapons placed on them. Do you see that? Take a look. She has wings and weapons. Okay. In front of Ishtar between two peaks is the sun god cutting his way through the mountains. From his shoulder, we can see there, we can see three wavy lines emanating from it. Do you see that? Note the uh, three wavy lines. The guy with a bow may represent Nus- Nuska, the hunting god. Over the line, we find a box with a Sumerian inscription. In the right panel, we see a capital T placed atop a triangle. The triangle represents the sign we, the sign me, which has a number meaning in including divine law, oracle, or universal law. That's what a uh, ma means. In the panel on the left, we read from top to bottom, medu, medu, metapa. And under these signs, under these signs, a boot-shaped sign with four lines on top, which reads, tudarlu. This panel reads, make the me, and trust the man to this person to make the perfect libation. In the left panel, we read from top to bottom. Look at that left panel. Nibutu gibu. In respect, in respect, make the perfect libation. Act justly in its distribution. This discussion of Proto-Sumerian writing systems make it clear that various ancient people in Sumer the Saharan region, and Egypt used a syllabic script. The inscriptions they left appear to have served served as talismans or amulets. They were carved to illustrate the devotion of these people to their gods and goddesses and are a great testimony to the great civilization built by the Proto-Saharans. I'm going to do, an, uh, I'm going to do a discussion on the Pro- Proto-Saharans uh, maybe next week or the following week. 
as you can see, the Sumerian seal cite evidence for this enslavement provides no evidence for this enslavement to relate to the simple, they relate to the simple worship of gods by the Sumerians. These seals were probably talisman meant to encourage the Sumerian people to reflect on their gods and do good. You know, there are three figures. Let's look at this, this one. There are three figures. These signs are associated with the figures. In the below image, we see the Sumerian sign of kingship, which is represented by the figure, which is a star shape, and includes 16 points. You see that? Look on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see the, uh, the star figure, which includes 16 points. The dots, the dots read Li. And the line is is i. In Sumerian, li'i means to become visible, to shine. Next, we see two gods. On the left, we see a humano fish figure. This god may represent the god Yah, who is like a fish and is supposed to be the creator of man. The other god may be Enlil. The hands of the gods point to the law, represent the sign Ita, and reads, send forth his touch. Between the gods and above them, we see a log-shaped figure with a number of lines. On the right-hand side of the log, we see two signs, a hook with a line under it. Okay, you can look at that. Look at that particular figure, the log shape. The hook is probably the, the U sign. The line, the line is read I. The two signs would read Ui, witness amazement. In the center of the log, we see a dot, Li, a half circle under it, you see. Circle A. Under the dot and a fan-like symbol, Pa. Under the fan is a large half circle, A. These symbols read Li, A, Pa, A, or become visible, a strong leader, the father, Pa, father. At the end of the log on the left-hand side, we see three signs, a vertical line, I, with two horizontal lines, Gu between it and another vertical line. These signs read, Igui, become a visible witness to the benefit of man. Under the sign in the center of the seal, we see a, a figure surrounded by dots, by the dot line symbol, Li'i, become visible. The next sign is the U, Powerful nourish. Within the U sign, we see repeatedly the dot, E, -E sign, between two lines on either side, Gu, Li Gu, send forth sustenance. These symbols probably read, become visible, a powerful leader, father, to send forth sustenance for mankind. Okay, again, that's the, uh, the symbol between the two gods. Okay. The Enlil, the Enlil situated at the end of the seal has his hand made in the shape of the two sign and reads, it too, send forth the libation. The guy, the guy Ea's hand is shaped in the sign of the Ita and reads, send forth, send forth his touch. See, whenever you're reading these inscriptions, these these ancient proto 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 Sumerian uh, texts. You have to look at every symbol, and every symbol within these within each of these seals have a particular meaning, and that's what you know we're looking at. Let's read the seal from right to left. Signs of the far right of the of the of the uh, seal read Memi me, Ita me, Gi Umi, 
Guluaimi. And that reads, the diviner has much power from the deity to send forth blessings, send forth the character of the diviner, act to send forth amazement to nourish the oracle and sustain man. The strong father sends forth the oracle. Next, we see the figure that resembles an arrow or spirit seated on a base. This spear or arrow figure is made up of a number of signs. They repod tau, reveal the character of a powerful man. On the left side of the spear arrow figure, we see a number of signs, beginning with a wave, Z, like signs, slightly above the head of the god. The wavy sign is Z and reads righteousness or breath of life. The god's hand points to the top of the spear. The other hand is, is changed in the Ita sign, send forth his touch. Below this, below this hand, we see two columns of signs. There are three signs to the right, su ayu, and reads wisdom sprouts from the father, leader, and, and amazement. Here you can see the, uh, here's the sign. You can see on the on the right-hand side, the guy in Leo, and on the uh, left, we can see the guy, Ia. So again, as I tell you, when we look at the hands and the figure, we see that that um, I is saying Ita, Send forth his touch, whereas in Lil is saying it to send forth the libation. So again, we're 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 talking about this this intimacy between man and the offering of libations to the gods. You see, here we can see a breakdown of the signs. For example, uh, when we look at the uh, the log with the figures on it, we see Ui witness amazement. The Apa, become visible, leader of the father. Then you can see some of the other signs, Ita, Igui. Then you can see the symbol for Mash. Then you see the symbol of Atutu and Patai, Pata. There are five signs on the left side under the hand. They read, and reads a phenomenal oracle to open up speech and entrust benefit for man, for you. Mm -hmm. Above the wavy line, we see a figure that has a U symbol above a circle between two boxes of logs with a fan under the circular figure. The U symbol equals U. The box figures read Bu, Mesh. The circle sign Ta, and the fan below the circle is Pa. This figure reads Ubu Mesh. Tabu mesh pa. The powerful man supports the character of a super perfect diviner and leader. It is important to note that when a sign is doubled, this represents reduplica reduplication or plural nature of the sign. There are proto Sumerian signs be between behind the middle god, between the god at the far left of the seal. The first sign is a half moon, which reads U or gaze at. The rest of the sign reading from top to bottom, alu, lu mai, ta mai, ta gun, alu, alu, mai, mai, ibe, tu mai. This passage reads, gaze at the man of power. Open up the divine decree. Entrust benefit to human beings. Distribute the oracle's divine decree to witness speech. Go forth to make a libation at the oracle. As I said before, you know, monosyllabic in, in, in Sumerian, Akkadian, um, that you have many uh, monosyllabic words. That means uh, that means either 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 a single consonant or vowel, or you have a consonant and a vowel. But these, in a sense, are monosyllabic uh, words. The seal is also relating to offering libation to the gods at an oracle. This oracle appears to speak to the supplicants. Given the text on the seal, the figure on the log probably represents Anu, the sky creator of all gods. These seals are telling mankind to offer a libation to Anu to make this god a visible figure in their life. 
It's not talking about no outer space, no people in spaceship. So let's read it. May me my my eita my gay you me my gulu I eme. The divine, the diviner has much power from the deity to send forth blessings. Send forth the character of the diviner. Act to send forth amazement to nourish the oracle and sustain man. The strong father sends forth the oracle. Yes, 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 yes. It's not talking about out of space. This is, in a sense, a seal. It's written to pay homage to the gods. Proto Sumerian seal number four is very interesting. Sumerian cylinder seal. Seal titled VA243. It is the 12th planet seal popularized by Sitchin. This is the uh, seal that that uh, that that Sitchin has used to kind of claim that uh, that the Anunnaki came from outer space. But let's see what it really means. Proto Sumerian seal four is a very interesting Sumerian cylinder seal. Title VA243. This is a famous seal because ancient alien theorists believe that VA243 describes the Anunnaki migration to Earth. Michael S. Hisger, in the myth of the 12th planet, a brief analysis of cylinder seal VA243, argues that this seal does not support the theory of a 12th planet, popularized by Zechariah Sitchin. Here you can see the seal. And again, this seal is supposed to be this is supposed to be talking about the Anunnaki, how they came to Earth and all, but that's not what it says, but we're going to get into that. Cylinder seal VA243 was first was first uh, dated in 1940 by Anton Mordgott. Mor Mordgott published his translation in the Brit in the Berlin Bardis Asiatic Museum's publication of its seal collection. The Verda, the Vlada, Asiatic, Rola Siegel, Siegel, West Asian Cylinder Seals by Mesopotamian scholar Anton Mort, Mortgat. Dr. Hezier provides an English translation of the German text as follows. This is what uh, this is what, how he translates it. Dub Siga, Dub Segi, a personal name of an apparently powerful person. Iliad, Iliad. Another personal name, this time of the seal owner. Line three is Er, Er, three, Su, Dien, Inish, German for your servant. In summary, Mordegard's translation of inscription V8243 reads, Dub Siga, Iliad, you his servant. Although this is Dr. Morgat's translation of seal of the seal, V8243, my reading of V8243 is much different. I interpret VA243 by reading the signs as linear Sumerian instead of cuneiform. So as you can see, you see all these signs. Look at all those signs in the but they're in red, blue, yellow, and red again. And as you can see, he, he says it's only saying what? Dubba Sega, Iliad, Iliad, you're your his servant, you know. And so this is what he says it 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 read. But it, it reads, it's more than that. And I'm gonna break it down for you. An examination of V243 indicates that this cylinder seal was a talisman. In addition to the three boxes of text discussed by Dr. Mordgat, there are also iconographic elements in the cylinder seal that also represent linear Sumerian signs as illustrated in the Proto-Sumerian. Here's a Proto-Sumerian seal number four. As you can see, here I break down all the various uh, signs. So, you know, take a few minutes and you can look at them. You see, and as you can see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's there's nine different groups of signs, and but he only, in a sense, he only he only said he could read maybe uh, two or three. But as you can see, all of these signs, everything on this on this seal has meaning. You know, cylinder proto-Saharan cylinder seal number four reads: the divinity has the power to rise up the talisman. Divine decree for, for this man. The depth of the talisman is to perfect the diviner. God perfect this man's divine decrees. This talisman commands it. Make perfect the, the libations. Make libations to the oracle. Pure esteem that goes to heaven. Yes, yes. And as you can see, 
you know, that translation wasn't good, but the reason is that he 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 was looking at it from what he thought was cuneiform, but he didn't understand that this wasn't written in cuneiform, you see. These were written in proto proto-Sumerian signs, as I show you on this uh, particular uh this particular uh, slide. In this translation of cylinder seal VA243, I will not decipher and read the star and dot signs. This seal reads as follows. The divinity has the power to rise up the talisman's divine decree for this man. The depth of the talisman is to perfect the diviner. God, perfect this man's divine decrees. This talisman commands it. Make perfect the levations. Make levation to the oracle. Pure esteem that goes to heaven. See, to summarize, these seals relate to being to being good luck talismans, reminding the bearer of the seal to worship their gods, not space travel. This discussion of proto-Sumerian seal writing systems make it clear that various ancient people in Sumer used a linear syllabic script. The seal transcriptions the Sumerians left, left appear to have served as talismans or amulets. The seals were, were carved to illustrate the devotion of the Sumerians to their gods and goddesses and are a great testimony to the great civilizations built by the people of Sumer. In conclusion, the Anunnaki theories represent a captivating aspect of alternative historical narratives and ancient astronaut theory created to deny the agency of black people in history. Yes, yes, yes. This Anunnaki theory, like this whole theory of, of everything coming from, from aliens from outer space, is to deny the fact that those ancient civilizations, Sumer, you know, the Indus Valley, Maluha, these civilizations were built by black people, but they don't want you to believe this. They want you to believe that some Anunnaki came and you know, they made the black people who were in these civilizations, their slaves, just like the white man is supposed to made us slaves. But it's all a lie. It's all a lie. While they may inspire curiosity and speculation, it's essential to, to approach them with caution and to subject them to rigorous scrutiny. Ultimately, the search for answers about human origins and the mysteries of the universe requires a careful examination of the available evidence and a commitment to the principles of scientific inquiry instead of accepting uncritically theories to, to falsify history by deleting black people from history. Yes, yes, yes. All this was made just to try to delete us from history. It's not going to work. You know, I'm, I'm going to put these slides in my Patreon, so go to Patreon to see the slides. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm on Twitter at Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winters 8. You can follow me also on TikTok dot com at Clyde Winners 3 uh go soon because uh they're trying to get rid of TikTok. You know you can uh view my shorts on uh you can view my shorts on uh at uh, TikTok. I think they're almost a million views so I'm pretty uh you know I'm pretty excited that uh that Yoshimad and uh and Q were able to uh to push these things and it's helping people on TikTok to learn more about our history and our culture by looking at my shorts. Uh, you're on a, you're on my my YouTube channel, Afrocentric History YouTube channel, and uh, you know come here. You can look at my videos. I have over 300 videos here. These videos, in a sense, will give you all tell you all aspects of Black history. Check these videos out if you want to know. You see, join my Patreon. I need your help. I need your support. Join my Patreon, and in a sense, it can help me to continue to make these type of presentations and continue to bring you the receipts. And often to get the receipts, it costs money. And that's what makes my uh, Patreon members so important to me. Also, in a sense, you can order my books on Amazon.com. Uh, don't forget to get my book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America. It is the only book. It's the only book that, that will tell you the history of the Black Aboriginals. It'll tell you about our technology. It'll tell you about our culture. It'll tell you about our religion. It'll tell you about how our societies were organized. It'll tell you about our architecture. You will find this is almost like an encyclopedia. It's over almost 500 pages, and it is totally about the Black Aboriginals. It is the only book that exists where you will find out everything about us, and you will find out that you've been lied to. The red men, they're not, the, they're not native to America. They're not the Native Americans. 
But if they want to call themselves Native Americans, fine. But it was the it was the black aboriginals who, who established civilization here, established a great culture, who built this country in terms of innocence, who whose artifacts were used by Europeans to build their trains, to build their buildings. You see, they got that stone and that rock from those pyramids that we made that were that used to exist in the Midwest, all the way down to the deep south. Yes, we created a great Aboriginal civilization. And I'm going to tell you about this, but get my book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America. You know, again, now some of the books that can help you to understand is I get my book, The Ancient Black Civilization of Asia. That'll tell you about the Mesopotamian Sumerians. Get my books, Black History Gem Essays, Volume 1, and Black History Gem Essay Volumes 2. I have several articles in those uh, in those uh, Black History Gem Essays, and these uh, Black History Gem Essays, they discuss uh, some of the Mesopotamian civilization. And again, my book, uh, The World History of the Black Race, get this book. This book gives you an introduction to every Black civilization that I know of that ever existed on the planet Earth all of them on every continent. Get this book, The World History of the Black Race. Okay, again, again, uh, we're uh, going to begin teaching part two of the Black British History course, and it's uh, delivered by myself and uh, Sister Shanice. And uh, it's, it's a very important uh, uh, course because uh, we, we did the course, and we finished it a few weeks ago. And uh, on the last course, you know, we discussed, in a sense, how... Uh, we discuss how to publish a book, how to publish articles. So it was a great, it was a great class. But in part two, we're going to go into the Celts. We're going to go into the uh, the uh, the uh, Black British, the Romans. We're going to go into, in a sense, the uh, a phenomenal uh, discussion on the Picts. You got to you got to join us in part two, part two, in a sense, because this is a this will revolutionize your understanding of Black history, and it will also tell you about the hidden histories of the Black British people. Yes, yes, yes. We always think of the Black British people as only just coming into the uh, the UK. They were always there. We were always there. You know, Britain, the UK, that was a Black civilization, you see. Uh, if you want to uh, take this course, you can go to https colon slash slash sistershanice.gumroad.com slash l slash F-U-P-F-U. -F -U. That's for the uh, payment of the full course. The course the course is six weeks. It's a six-week course and only costs 200, 200 pounds, you see. Now, if you want to get a $40 discount, you can join the class. If you join the class before April, you can get a discount of $40. And so you would only have to pay $150 for a six-week class. This is six weeks, a two-hour class. And most of the time, we when we held a class, sometimes we'd be talking all the way for, you know, maybe to, uh, maybe to uh, 11 o'clock British time. If you want to get the discount, go to HTTPS colon slash slash sister, sister Shanice dot gumroad dot com slash L slash FUP FU slash early bird. Go there and don't be square. Join us in uh, part two of our hidden history our hidden chapters of Black History course. You're going to find it exciting. Okay, also, if you're really interested in, uh, in learning how to do research, if you want to become a researcher, if you want to, if you want to, in a sense, produce books and articles, if you want to understand literature, if you want to be able to make your business better by learning the various marketing techniques and also how to do the research to be able to make anything that you do fantastic, join my 15-week Afrocentric research course. Yes, it's 15 weeks. It's 15 weeks. The research course, <laughs> it costs $599. But you can pay the $599 when you join the class, or you can pay over a, a three-month period $199, you know, per month for three months. You see, if you want to uh, if you want to join the class and pay the full $599, go to Clyde98.gumroad.com slash L slash ZBWRJR. If you want to, uh, if you want to pay in three monthly installments, go to Clyde98.gumroad.com/l/o/lz 
VX. You see, the class is going to start April 16th. And uh, this class is going to be from 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. <coughs> the other class, the other class, that we, the uh, British history class, that's going to start at 9. That's going to be between 7.30 and 9.30, but that's British time. That's not American time. See, that's not American time. In America, 7.30 <coughs> is uh, 1.30 p.m. So don't get it, don't get it twisted. The uh, British history class, that's going to be on, on GM, that's going to be on British time. The American class is going to be Central Standard Time, 7 to 9 p.m., 15 weeks. You're going to, after you take this class, you're going to be an excellent researcher as long as you participate in the class <coughs> and you do the assignments. Okay, I, uh, I'd like to show you a couple more things. Uh, you know, my uh, my introduction my introduction was done by uh, by Yoshi Mott. And uh, how you doing, uh, Sir Leroy? <coughs> Brave Cold Water, Penrose, seventy eight twenty five tones five. What up, dude? Uh, Super Mike twenty one sixty four and JP JP buy her book. <coughs> she's done a very a very uh, great book that she's done on. Uh, on uh, Southeast Asia, get her book. Find out about those civilizations in Southeast Asia that other uh, black people founded. JP's written a book that you need to buy, purchase, and join her in this. But uh, this is something also I'd like you to buy. You know, Yoshimad, Yoshimad has given us, in a sense, some uh, very, some very, uh, Yoshimad has given us some uh, very, uh, some very important uh, information. And the thing is, this is that what Yoshimad is doing is that we need to really, we need to really check out uh, Yoshimad so that Yoshimad can help us, help you to be able to make your uh, site into a very, very, you know, engaging site, a site that can help, uh, you know, people learn more and more about uh, about our history. And so then I'd like you to uh, maybe, uh, you know, support, uh, support, uh, you know, Yoshi Mod. Hey, B1 family, I'm excited to tell you about something super special and educational. This Black History Month, Yoshi Mod has created an amazing collection of PDFs all about incredible Black inventors and their amazing achievements. Do you know about Mae Jemison, the first FBA woman astronaut? Or Percy Julian? who made groundbreaking discoveries in chemistry. These are just a couple of the amazing people you'll learn about in these PDFs. These PDFs are perfect for teachers, homeschooling parents, or anyone who loves learning. They're filled with fun facts and inspiring stories that make learning about Black history exciting. Only $3 for a journey through history with some of the most influential Black inventors and scientists. Just click the link in the description to grab your copies from Yoshi Mod's Gumroad store. And don't forget to check out Yoshi Mod's other amazing creations and music on Spotify. Let's learn, have fun, and celebrate Black history together. Okay, uh, check that out. And, uh, you know, Yoshi Mod, he did my introductory video. And uh, he can do the same for you. He can make your, your, little, your small business, make your videos, make them very excellent. So these are some of the uh, services that he offer. At Yoshi Mod Productions, we're here to take your brand and creativity to new heights. From EPKs to AI commercials, animated music commercials to animated AI bios, book covers to picture flyers, and so much more, we've got you covered. Our team is dedicated to delivering high quality, cutting edge designs that leave a lasting impression. And for our valued clients, we offer exceptional creativity, a customer-centric approach, and work that reflects the latest trends and technologies. Just about making art, we're about creating experiences. Your brand, your vision, our artistry. Professionalism and reliability are the cornerstones of everything we do. 
do more than a service we're your creative partners if you're ready to make your brand shine look no further than yoshima productions join us in the journey of creativity contact us today and let's make your vision a reality Okay, again, uh, again, I try to check out some of those services, you know. Um, Sir Leroy asked an interesting question. He said, what's the difference between Sumerian and Mesopotamia? Sumerian is just the name of that, 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 uh, that Opert gave the uh, people that built the, uh, the earliest civilization in Mesopotamia. Meso Mesopotamia is just the, uh, the area, the area in which, uh, the Sumerian and Akkadian civilization existed. That's what they call Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia is the geographical area, where Sumerian, that's the uh, name of the people, you know. Again, uh, I, I uh, you know, how you doing, CGI Kid Productions? What up, though? Again, in a sense, we have a little time. So if, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, and I'll see if I can answer them. But again, as I want you to understand is that the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki, like this whole idea, this whole idea of, 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 of ancient astronauts, this was invented not because of the fact that it has any type of um, historical reality, that it is factual, or that it is valid. It is invalid. It has no, it's not substantiated by the Sumerian text. And yet they say that Sumerian texts are talking about the Anunnaki and how they brought, brought civilization here, how they, in a sense, enslaved the people. We went through those seals that these people used to try to imply that the Anunnaki people existed. And as I've shown you, none of that is what's really written there, you see. That is not written there. And see, that's one of the reasons why I teach this research class. I teach this research class so that I can teach people how to really understand, in a sense, you know, you know how you can really understand what's going on. You know, because the thing is this is that that, that much of the knowledge much of the knowledge is out there, but you had to learn languages. You had to learn how to interpret a lot of information. And, and, that, and that often, in a sense, just looking at things from face value cannot get you anywhere. One of the, you know, like there's, an, uh, there's a, page, a person called Karimio. Karimio, he brings a lot of good books on his site when he tries to talk about the Aboriginal people, or when he tries to talk about the earliest migrants. How are you doing, Penrose 7825, when he's, when, you're trying, when he's trying to talk about, in a sense, the various people? You know, but the, but the problem is this, is that he, he just reads the books, but he doesn't know how to interpret the literature. That's why when you join my class, you learn how to read the literature, you learn how to interpret it, you learn how to write books and articles. And see, that's what we need. If we're going to, in a sense, allow people to understand our history, to, to be able to fight caves, culturally acquired identity immune deficiency syndrome. That means that we're going to have to, in a sense, write the correct research, teach our people the truth. And by teaching our people the truth, by teaching them, in a sense, the reality of what really went on in history and how, and how history, in a sense, does not deny our agency. We had a great agency in history. We built these civilizations. And yet to try to deny the authenticity of Black people in terms of building these civilizations They've had to create this myth of the Anunnaki. They've had to, to, to create this myth of, of ancient astronauts and see. But we had to move away from this and we had to begin in a sense to realize that what they're teaching is a lie, you see? One of the many lies that they teach us, they teach us to keep us off track, you know. Okay, I, uh, I don't see any... Uh, any questions in the uh, in the chat? So uh, maybe we'll just uh, end it right here. Thank you guys for uh, for showing up this week. Uh, on Friday, on Friday, I'm going to do a, a special uh, live presentation, and uh, the special uh, the special uh, live presentation, you know, you know, the this live presentation. What it is is that it's going to discuss the uh, the black uh, the black the black Irish and how the Black Irish contributed to the rise of of, uh, of the, uh, the the 
the chattel slave population on American plantations. So join me tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And tomorrow night at 7 p.m., I'm going to, in a sense, discuss the origin of the Black Irish and why, you know, and why, and, and even how it was Black people who created St. Pa Patrick's Day. Because it's based upon St. Patrick, who was a Black Irishman, you see. But again, I'm going to discuss that tomorrow night, so join me at, uh, at 7. So we can, uh, you know, 7. Let's see, uh, here's something, uh, you know, Team Zulu. Team Zulu says, during the time of Kemet, when they first began to allow Europeans to be taught at, the, at those universities, did they teach them everything in specific study because they was Europeans? Um, you had to understand, in a sense, is that I think that uh, they taught them uh, some knowledge, but I don't know if they taught them all the knowledge, because remember, in a sense, is that there's secret knowledge that you can't really teach. In any secret society, there's, te there's secret knowledge that you can't really teach. But when those, uh, when those people came from, from, uh, from ancient Europe to study in Egypt, they did teach them a lot of knowledge. And that's why, if you notice, if you read, uh, if you read the literature, you see that the, uh, that the, uh, that the Greeks, they didn't mind admitting that much of, uh, much of what they learned, much of uh, their, uh, their knowledge came from the Egyptians. You know, Socrates, on the other hand, Socrates, he was an Athenian. And when you read about Athenians, Athenians are used in a sense, these were uh, people who were descendants of the Garamantes. And because they're descendants of the Garamantes, what we find in a sense is that they, these people, uh, Socrates, that's one of the reasons why they killed him, because he used to use what, what we call today as teachers, the Socratic me method. And the Socratic method of teaching is a method of teaching in which, in which you ask questions because see, you know, you ask questions so that the student can be able to 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 develop an idea or an understanding of a particular uh, experience. You see, okay. So again, uh, thank you guys for uh, showing up, and uh, see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m., same time, same station. But we're going to talk about the uh, the black the black Irish origin of uh, St. Patty's Day. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to know this because, see, a lot of us, a lot of us do have this black Irish ancestry. And it's best to understand is that 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 we're not we're not talking out of our ethnic. We're not trying, in a sense, to to try to emulate uh, Europeans. We do have a black Irish foundation and these black Irish were made slaves between 1625 and uh, <coughs> and 16 and 1665. You see. Take care. Have a good day. See you tomorrow night. Bye.